All right, and we are back live on the dev Twitch stream. My name is Nick Taylor. I'm a lead software engineer at Forum. Forum is a software that powers dev. You were like questioning yourself when you were saying that. I think I am this. <laughs> yes. No, it wasn't I'm Christina that is... Gorton. <laughs> I'm a developer advocate at Forum. <laughs> and today we have Lori Barth with us. Lori, talk about Hello. yourself. Tell us about you. Oh, goodness. Hi, I'm Lori. Um, I am a senior software engineer at Netflix, uh, but mostly in the sort of public sphere I've known, I'm known for being uh, educators, normally specifically around JavaScript, some web dev stuff, some career stuff, um, and Lego building, obviously. Um, <laughs> so yeah, nice to be here. And I'm in chat too. So if people are, are in the chat, I can say, hey. Free to chat. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> So, awesome. uh, yeah, so today we are going to be talking about the hiring process from yeah. both sides. Is that right? I, I Everyone's guess favorite so. Topic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lori doesn't have too many opinions about this or thoughts on it. So uh, this may be short. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So we are talking about tech interviews today. Um, I, I definitely wanted to talk to you about this because I've seen I think we see the angle all the time from people who are doing interviews. Um, and then I've seen you talk a lot and mention a lot, which I think we should still talk about. But I, I think uh, I've seen you mention a lot. And what I really appreciated is you talking about kind of the brokenness and also ways people can do better who are interviewing the interviewees. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely wanted to chat about that with you today. And so we appreciate having you on here. Yeah, happy to be yeah. here. Um, People, I think there was a period of time where I was, you know, particularly vocal about it, probably because I was secretly interviewing and nobody knew it, um, <laughs> but I did a lot of uh, sort of loudly talking. I won't say complaining. I will say loudly talking. Um, I did a lot of loud talking about how uh, the interview process is really, really broken. Um, I wrote this really long post. It's got a ridiculous title. Thanks to my friend, Amberly, who came up to it. Um, and it's yeah. something... Like if, um, if a senior interview is three junior interviews in a trench coat and I do five, is it additive or exponential? <laughs> the greatest blog post title that has ever existed in the history of the universe. And I can say that because even though it's mine, I did not come up with the title. Yeah. Um, there you go. Awesome. But I got it here. It, I'm going to drop it in the chat. So. Yeah. So it's this really <laughs> long narrative. Like it is a long post. Um, it is not meant to be prescriptive. It is literally a narrative of my own experience, um, interviewing with a lot of different companies. I didn't include every detail. I did, didn't, yeah. you know, name or blame any companies, but I talked about them in the abstract and mm -hmm. specifics. Um, okay. because I thought it was really important to show people like for all intents and purposes, I have every benefit and every privilege in the world. I was employed by a well-known company at the time that I was interviewing. I had a staff mm -hmm. engineer title. Um, I had, you know, no time limitations in terms of interviewing other than having a full-time job, but like yeah. my husband can take care of the dog. We have no kids, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I had all of these benefits. Plus I have this really large network at this point and this uh, public persona. I am easily searchable on the internet and you can find a bunch of things that prove that I at least can fake that I know what I'm talking about um, <laughs> as a software engineer. So I have all of these things, right? Yeah, and yeah. it still took me six months to find yep. the right job. And yep. it wasn't like I got an offer from every company either. I had lots of yep. failures along the way. I had lots of interview processes that I just totally bombed. Um, I had some that went really far. So writing this all up was really important to me because I wanted to remove this idea that like, there's a point at which this becomes not shitty. It's mm -hmm. always shitty. And what does that Thank say? You. What does Thank it say you. that yes. it's always shitty? Um, I think there's sort of like Three. a few things that make it <laughs> shitty in a different way. So one of the things, like all of those privileges and, and sort of public persona and all of that meant that pretty much everywhere I applied, I got a call back. That's rare, right? Normally yeah. you have to send hundreds yeah. and hundreds of applications in yeah. between the yeah the contacts I have and uh, the name that I guess I fostered in some way, I mostly got a call back. I'm also yeah. a white woman with a master's degree in computer science in software engineering. I'm like 
the unicorn of diversity, which is terrible in many, many, many ways. So, right, I, always, I yeah. almost always got a callback. From that callback, um, I'm very outgoing and somewhat personable. And so it was very, very rare that I would have a conversation with a recruiter. And by very rare, I mean, I don't think it ever happened where I had a mm -hmm. conversation with a recruiter where they didn't decide to forward me onto a hiring manager, right? So then okay. I get to the hiring manager interview. And the hiring manager interview is again, a conversation, which I'm yeah. pretty good at. I was a consultant for seven years. This is what I do. Um, yeah. I would sometimes pull out of that conversation and decide that it wasn't the right role for me, but oftentimes I was would move on. Okay. Which means in almost every case, I made it to whatever the final round of an interview is, which is like six different interviews. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't get the job or, and then they decided, you know, not to move on with me. So it's like, yeah. The, yeah. it's not the worst case scenario. I don't want to say that. Like the worst case scenario is that you don't hear back and you're trying and you're trying and you're just trying to get an opportunity to show what you can do. I had millions of opportunities to show what I can do. That's a very privileged position to be in. But yeah. I was spending the most amount of time in every hiring process and not necessarily ending up with offers. Um, okay. Or I was spending, you know, periods of time in shorter interview processes and it wasn't the right role for me or not the place I wanted to be or any of that. So that's my like saga of that interview. And I write some of that in that really long titled blog post. Yeah, uh, yep. I'll just stop you for a sec. Clearly TD in the chat saying, I always do well at the stages before the technical, LMAO, mm -hmm. recruiter screen, no props, talking to the manager, no props, oh. solving a technical problem in an hour or less, bomb. Yeah. Bomb, bomb, yeah. bomb. Which is unrealistic so, too. <laughs> I think we should talk about it. So technical screens. Yeah. Um, we have moved away from, for the most part, whiteboarding interviews. I don't see them as often. Part of yeah. that is because you can't use a physical whiteboard anymore because everything is remote <laughs> because of COVID. Um, the other part of that is I think they got a bad reputation. So people sort of shifted without really making any substantial changes. So what yep. they shifted to is um, you will live code in front of me in some realistic environment on your own computer. And I will expect you to do something really fast with no mistakes because it's simple. Yep. Okay. Well, how many times have you wondered for an hour uh, why something wasn't working and realized that you missed the S on the end of the variable name? And how often, even with a linter and prettier and all of these other things, will you realize that you're missing a curly brace after 10 minutes? And how often will you realize that you forgot the freaking return keyword and mm -hmm. that's why nothing's oh, happening? Oh, my worst one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. so Fine. we do this as professional engineers in a non-anxious environment when no one is watching us habitually. Every, yeah. multiple times a week, I would say. Yeah. So why do we think that watching someone code in a completely unrealistic environment in the span of an hour and giving them a simple problem is going to go well? Like, why, yeah. why do we think that's a thing that's going to go well? And I will say, as someone who's done this a fair amount, I don't do half bad with these. It's a weird skill because I used to do debate and musical theater and like the performance side of me is like, yeah, sure, let's go. Sometimes do I totally bomb it because my brain's tired? Yeah, sure. Most of the time it goes pretty okay. That yeah. doesn't mean I'm a better developer or should get the job. In fact, yeah. it might mean the opposite. It might mean that I'm just really, really good at stupid, silly problems and can't do complicated things, right? Like it's yeah. completely nonsensical. So I'm sorry that they're giving you tactical interviews that are bad and that you bomb. Um, there are some patterns that we're seeing. There's some patterns that I've been promoting uh, that I think are going to help with that. So the first mm -hmm. is a lot of places have talked about, oh, we'll just give everyone a take home. Well, that yeah. doesn't really yeah. work well for people who don't have the free time to work on that, especially when they're like, well, we yeah. gave them a week and it's only four to six hours. I'm like, ha, four to six hours in a week? I'm sorry. Do you yeah. raise children? Like, yep. what? <laughs> I don't, but I'm No, aware. it's worse when they say this should only take you an hour and you know that that's not what that's not what is going to happen. There are so many yeah, that yeah. I like spent way too much time on and, yeah, and then got the you nothing. Know, things they'll be yeah. like, "Well, you didn't include tests." And you'll be like, "Well, I ran out of time." They're like, "Well, why did you include decide not to include tests?" It's like, "Well, would you have wanted me to give you a solution that doesn't work?" 
Like what yeah. were you, what was supposed to get thrown off the boat that you would have accepted? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Works for me was I got told I could use whatever. And I thought I was okay. I'll use the tech stack that they're using. And then they came back with, why are you using a framework? And I'm like, that is what you all use. <laughs> why didn't you say you just wanted me to use yeah, no yeah, framework? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Let me write that in assemb in assembly. Uh, you know, like uh, so. Yeah, I think you're seeing a lot of places that recognize that that's not a fair choice. Um, being like, okay, we're gonna give everyone a take home. Okay, we're gonna give everyone an in person. They solve different problems. So the best solution I've seen is that they have two. Um, you have an in person exercise that's an hour and synchronous, and we talk through it, and you have a take home exercise that is a little bit longer, a little bit more involved, but you get to do it on your own time. And then mm -hmm. you let people choose what makes the most sense for them. Because the entire point of an interview process is that people can show off, uh, yeah. you know, themselves and what highlights their skills in the best way. So that mm -hmm. is, that's great progress. I think that's awesome because even the same person might not choose the same option depending on what their interview is, what the mm -hmm. full process is, what yeah. company it is, how they feel about how interested they're, they are in getting that role, what other interviews are going through at that time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing I'm seeing is uh, a lot of interview processes will include multiple technical rounds and they yeah. used to include multiple hands-on technical rounds, which I think is sort of silly. So I don't agree with, the argument, but I have heard the argument that says, if you uh, don't have someone write code, then how do you know they know how to write a for loop? I've met PhD candidates who can talk really well, but don't know what var means. And I'm like, okay, I think that's a silly example. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. happened maybe 0.0001% yeah. of the time, but fine. <laughs> assuming, assuming your assertion is correct and that that is a possibility, Shouldn't a single coding exercise of any type assuage you of those fears? And then yeah, if you yeah. wanna have, if you're, the point of interviewing is looking for signals, right? So if you're looking for signals, your first signal supposedly that you care about is, can they write a for loop? Fine, okay, you've dealt with that in whatever hands-on, whether take home or in person. Yeah. But if you have another round and you're saying, we need other signals, we need other technical signals, you're normally not looking for, can they write a for loop? you're normally looking for what is their awareness of this particular ecosystem that we work in or what kind of patterns have they worked with or how do they collaborate with people on technical problems or how do they communicate about these things or what is their depth of experience and expertise and at what level? Yeah. And you can get all of that through a conversation. Um, so I think we're seeing more of that as well. So like a single technical round and then some other technical conversations later on. The other thing that I'm trying to do is move away from the idea that an in-person technical one hour exercise needs to be, you know, a recursion exercise or some other algorithm data structure nonsense. It doesn't, yeah. um, it can be a lot of different things. It can be a debugging exercise, which is something that I've run before that I think is really effective. It can be yeah. a like 10 minute, can you create an input field and click a button and make a fetch call sort of thing? I've seen yeah. those. Yeah. I've done those as an interview candidate before. I think those are particularly effective. Um, but when you get like a giant checkbox, I, I interviewed at one company. I won't name who they are, but uh, it was checkbox check box code. <laughs> no, it was an hour long interview. And I think there were 15 things for me to implement. Ooh. And they just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Um, and I happen to know people who were able to look at that feedback because I was like, what went wrong? Um, and it was really silly, silly thing. So first of all, I didn't finish like the 20 checkbox items in an hour. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't have finished that if you gave me an hour on my own. That's a lot of stuff to yeah. work through. And I'd never seen the exercise before. Um, the second piece of feedback was that I used JavaScript when I could have used CSS. Um, and that's fair. I was passing. I... It wasn't the typical use JavaScript when you could have used CSS situation though. It was, mm -hmm. okay. I passed a ternary that changed the class name for the highlight color instead of doing like a pseudo selector uh, that would have yeah, 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 every yeah. other. And I'm like, I don't use pseudo selectors that often. I mean, I use them sometimes, but I would have had to look that up versus the JavaScript ternary I knew would work right yeah. away. And it was a 
tw- this was like the last two seconds and they were like, oh, let's try and fit this one more thing in. So like, again, silly. I'd yeah. shown that I knew somewhat what I was talking about. What? And then the thing that really bugged me was um, there was this idea of like, she can't think and react. I was like, mm. what does that mean? Yeah. Because I wrote some console log statements and because I uh, was writing a use state and I think I was like flustered and I used curly braces instead of square brackets and it took me a second oh my gosh. to realize that. That I happens to me all the time. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> right. As a teacher, so- that happened to me all yeah. the time while right. streaming to hundreds of students. <laughs> like, that's okay. So I'm like, <laughs> of course I can't think and react. I'm not a computer. I'm yeah. a human who translates human into what works in computer. What is the problem here? Like what, what's happening? Um, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that's bad. And those exercises exist and those companies exist. And yeah. like they exist even within companies that are known for being like super awesome places to work. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, why doesn't your working environment match yeah. your interview environment because your interview yeah. is your first impression of the place you're going to work and i yep. think companies take that for granted and for a long long time because of what they pay and because you know some of these were like the cool places to work they have yeah you know more applicants than they can shake a stick at well right now in this particular environment i think we're seeing some scrambling um i mm-hmm. tweeted the other day that i got an email from a recruiter who's rec- who's emailed me like five times over the past few months. And the new, yeah. and the last one was like, it's the role's remote now. And now it's the ro- role's remote and they've increased the salary. And I was like, yeah. what yeah. is happening? Like, I'm not <laughs> interested in this role. I have no intention of leaving my job. I don't even know what the company is. It's one of those generic recruiters, but like, yeah. wow, yeah, you're yeah. really barking up this tree. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm rambling. I'm sure we have- It's okay. Uh, it's all good. I do want to- say uh just a couple things in the chat here we've got we've had some conversation which is great uh so um clear clearly td did say like and i agree with this i think we were just talking about this is i don't they said i don't like interviews where they are looking for you to say exactly a thing like Mm -hmm. they're just looking for that just like you were saying with like the css selectors and the javascript like you implemented something css selectors you know pseudo selectors are something you could look up if you needed to later on (laughs) like it's not you're you're showing that you're technical uh they're being petty yeah Yeah. exact right word yeah you know like if anything they could have said oh by the way maybe you could have done it this way but this is fine you implemented it you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. to be fair they did not give me this feedback this was the feedback they wrote when Mm -hmm. other people were deciding i just happened to know someone who who was able to look at it (laughs) yeah 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 but and then the other thing which i think we'll talk about a little bit later because you kind of wrote an article somewhat touching on this stuff uh so the star program type behavior questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I've gone through at AWS. So I have opinions on that too, I guess, but they oh. said they just really dislike those. <laughs> I literally, and I think that's so Andrew. I've but. heard this phrase a lot recently. So I did, I wrote this post literally earlier this week. Um, okay. We can link it. I've never, I've heard of the star framework. I've never looked it up. I've never read about mm-hmm. it. Um, maybe I never heard about I it either. Naturally, I don't, like Christina, can you tell I us? Have yes. So is it, is it a is it a cult story? Or, it? So <laughs> it's 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 exactly what you're talking about in your post, which I'll grab in a minute and and link to where you're. It's Claudina. Hi, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, where you you are going to tell a story, and so you're you you have a story, but you have to have like exactly what you were saying in your in um your article where you have like you have this beginning, you have like this middle, you have this end, you need to have some kind of like (laughs) point to your story that goes along with whatever questions that they have. Uh, The STAR actually stands for some acronym, which I can't remember at the moment. I can look it up in a second, but it's exactly that where you start out and at AWS, when you're interviewing there or Amazon, I think in general, uh, they tell you, they send you all of these things and they say, Uh, this is the format we're going to have. Uh, you need to answer these questions this way. You need to come up with these kinds of stories because if you don't, no one's going to hire you here, <laughs> uh, basically is how it is. So they do give okay. you all these like behavioral questions and every single one you're supposed to answer in that like star format of you have this like starting 
uh, basically sentence of like what's going on. You have this middle and then you have a conclusion and they want it kind of succinct. So you have these okay. th- things and you're not supposed to be rambling basically. That's what they want you to do. So I really <laughs> love when we create frameworks and methodologies for things that are just this would be the best case answer, right? Like that's yeah. nonsensical because then everyone's trying to think in this hierarchical, very rigid, like I need to do this and this and this and this mm-hmm. and this and this and follow this formula. And then my answer will be right. And it's like, no, wouldn't it be better if we talked about what a good answer looks like and what would be effective for a hiring manager to hear? So the reason I wrote yeah. the post that I wrote this week, having never heard of the star methodology and apparently saying a lot of the things it says, but hopefully in a more approachable yeah. and a <laughs> less obnoxious way. Um, the reason I wrote it is because I think it can be very hard if you've never been an interviewer to mm-hmm. recognize that the things um, that you think are just small mistakes or like, oh, I didn't answer that quite well, are actually a lack of information for your interviewer. And that's not okay. meant to be, you know, like your interviewer is being mean. But there have been plenty of times in my interviewing history where I've been a candidate and I've said, um, you know, oh, that was a little rambly, but like, she understands my background, she got my point. Mm -hmm. No, she doesn't know my background. And so she didn't get my point. And it's not because she wasn't trying, it's because the only information that interviewer had was what I gave her. And maybe my resume, but like your resume isn't as verbose and detailed as you think it is because yeah. mm-hmm. they again don't have all of the contact if they actually looked at it or whoever's yeah, actually yeah, interviewing yeah, yeah, yeah. right That's now a whole other story <laughs> but like and i know hiring managers who try not to look at your resume because they don't want to bias themselves in looking mm-hmm. for specific gaps so like there's different ways that people do things but i think yeah if you are a candidate what you have to recognize is that when you're in these conversational interviews star be damned um you the information you're giving the interviewer is the only information that they have and it's not only you that they're looking at they're not i mean they're trying to give you the benefit of the doubt don't get me wrong they want you to do well like an interviewer mm-hmm. wants you to do well because they want to be able to hire you because they want to be done with hiring can they i want to be done with interviews you? yes yeah they want to yeah, be yeah. done with interviews like they want you to do well so first of all take comfort in that they want you to do well um that'll put yourself at ease a little bit but the other thing is they're only getting the information that they're getting from you. And they also are probably interviewing multiple other people at the same time. And so they're not Mm -hmm. going to try and read between the lines for everything you said to make you the perfect case scenario because they come with their own baggages, baggage and bias when they listen to you. Mm -hmm. And unconscious bias is a thing and all of those things, but Think about it this way. If I knew someone, if I had a previous employee, let's say I'm a hiring manager. If I had a previous employee who had interviewed with us and said that they, you know, were really excited about the job and asked a question at the end of the interview about this other job at our company. And I was like, oh, cool. They're interested in like their growth opportunity. And then they came on and within a month they threatened to leave because they weren't happy in the role and they got transferred to that other position. And then I had to hire again. And Mm -hmm. you tell a story about how interested you are in the career path over there, my baggage is gonna play into that, whether you were planning on playing out that scenario the same way the previous employee did. Is that fair to you? No, but no one is a blank slate. No hiring manager could ever be a blank slate. They in fact are a manager in part because they're using their previous experiences to help inform how to create a high functioning, productive, Uh, cohesive, diverse team, right? So Mm -hmm. all of these things, which is to say, I'm going the very long way around to this (laughs) point, but when you're answering those questions, there are some things that you need to do. And apparently they're in the STAR framework, but let's just say, you know, there's like three checklist items. Mm -hmm. One is, yes, you do need to be concise because if you meander Mm -hmm. around, they're going to lose your point by the time that you get to the end of it and they're going to lose the opportunity to ask you other questions, which is more positive signals that could have been made in your favor. So it's actually better for you to have a short answer. That's maybe not a great signal than ramble for a long time and remove the possibility of you making a good impression on other questions. Okay. So that's number one, two beginning, middle and end and make it clear and make sure it has a point. All of those are ways of saying, 
make sure you're telling the story well. Make sure you're telling a narrative that they can follow that answers their question and that's compelling, right? You know that intuitively. No one needs to give you a framework to say, if someone asks you a question and the answer needs yeah. to be a story, make it a good story, right? That's just common sense. And then the third piece is recognize that you won't be able to come up with this on the spot. Some people mm -hmm. can't. Some people are actors. Some people have been doing extemporaneous speaking all throughout high school. <laughs> Some people just got really good at lying to their parents and coming up with stories on the spot, right? <laughs> like everyone has different skill sets. But for most people, you can't get a question you've never heard before. All of a sudden, yeah. figure out what story you're gonna tell, craft the way you're gonna tell the story and then make it sound really good and make sure you're not rambling and all these other things. Because every answer I've given since we started this stream, I'm rambling because I don't have prepared <laughs> answers, right? Perfect example. I sound cool, I'm engaging, I'm outgoing, but I have no time limit and I'm not trying to make a good impression. If yeah, I yeah. was, I would have set a timer now for right. you. <laughs> no. was, I would have like this little canned story ahead of time and I'd have six of them. And then depending on yeah. the question they had asked, yeah. I'd be able to throw it out. And it doesn't have to be word for word. It doesn't have to be a script, but if you've practiced it twice, it's going to sound mm -hmm. infinitely better than if you make it up on the fly. Okay. Yeah. I want to add to that a little, cause I did get the acronym and I do want to say like, I do have a lot of opinions about kind of the behavior questions and, and them in general, but interviewing at AWS, I didn't think I was going to get that job. I interviewed there because I wanted to try to interview at like a, you know, a bigger company to see what it was like. I did take away from that, like the ability to do exactly what you were saying there. Like, because I had to think of those scenarios, it helped me so much later on in my interviews for the jobs that I, I did think I was going to get, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, the acronym is specific situation, task, action, result. So you, you give that situation to whatever behavioral thing they're asking. Like, you know, this one time you, you worked with the manager and there was an issue and, blah, you know, you come up with a specific situation what you mm -hmm. had to do, the action that you took for it, and then the result. And that's re really, they want the results. And then I think the bigger thing that um, Lori was saying there is if you keep it concise, if you don't give them all the information, that's okay because they have the time to follow up questions then. And that's when they can dig in more. And you want to give them that ability to like be able to dig in a little bit more as well. Someone yeah. just put a great comment that yeah, that's the one. The live one. Yeah, yeah. You go. You go. <laughs> what would be the harm in telling people questions ahead of time? Um, I I think that's awesome. I've started mm -hmm. to see places that are doing that. Uh, and I AWS think that's does. Great. Um, give you the questions ahead of time. There are uh, they places... give you the general questions like ahead yeah. of time. Some yeah. people give you the specific questions. The places that don't, um, either have outdated ways of interviewing, or mm -hmm. they don't know what they are. Um, and yep. I think that's important to talk about. So yep. if you are a hiring manager and you have a conversational interview or a colleague or whoever's interviewing someone and you have a conversational interview, it's possible that you know that every conversation that you have is going to be different and tailored to the candidate and the signals that you don't yet have from that candidate. So mm -hmm. because of the way all of these different communications channels move and you've got an HR person and a hiring manager and all the people on the panel and blah, 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 blah. Being able to send a specific list ahead of time to each candidate of the questions that they are going to be asked because they're going to differ yeah. is impossible. But even if they knew the first question they were going to ask you, they wouldn't know the next five because the next five they ask are based on where you go with that first yeah. answer and wanting to dig into yeah. this a little more or dig into that a little more. And so a lot of these conversation and behavioral type interviews are more exploratory and specific than you might think. And yeah, they, they've they asked the question, you know, can you tell me about a time when a million times, but they don't know that they're gonna ask you that question. Mm -hmm. They ask you that question because they just heard you talk about a situation where the CEO was pushing you to do something that you thought was a bad technical decision and they wanna yeah. know how you handled it, right? So, um, I, I commend the um, transparency that's happening right now and the fact that there are places that are starting to, you know, create these lists of questions, but keep in mind that there are places that literally couldn't do that even if they tried, because it's not the way that their interview works. And if it was, mm -hmm. it would actually be a less effective interview because it would be too canned and it wouldn't help get to the bottom of the specific candidate in question. I think what people don't realize um, is 
for new career roles, you probably have a very small scope of what mm -hmm. work you expect them to do. And you know, you know, we need a, someone who's gonna be able to contribute to React and learn a little bit of, um, you know, Postgres or whatever it is. For yeah. senior roles, it's actually the opposite of that. Like we mm -hmm. need to round out the team with a senior person. No one senior is the same. And so they could be interviewing five different people with five very different profiles that all have some overlap in a specific area. And so the interviews for those people end up differing pretty significantly from conversation to conversation, even though the rounds are the same and the people involved are the same. Yeah, same happens with community management and dev, dev advocacy in my experience with interviews. <laughs> interviewing oh, people. Sure. They're yeah. just like, yeah. because you could be so many different things in those roles and they're just like trying to figure out what where you fall in that. And then also what do they need if you fall in that? Yeah. <laughs> right, but like there's, <laughs> There's a scenario in which I'm sure Christina and I could interview for similar jobs if I went back in the DevRel direction and the mm -hmm. skill sets mm -hmm. we bring would be nowhere near the same. Exactly. Complete yeah. opposite. Yep. The, the, the other thing about the interview process on both sides is like, you don't have a lot of time with these people, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like me as an interviewee, like I had maybe, maybe I have like, two, four hours with some people at this company, it looks pretty good. I think, I don't know. Like, you know, like you, you can't, it's, it's kind of like you, you do your best effort to say, well, I think this looks good. I've spoken to some people. And like you said, the interview process plays into that. But even on the, the hiring side, you know, it's like, I've just interviewed, you know, like 600 candidates over the past two months, you know, like, who do we pick? I mean, you have notes and stuff, obviously, but it's like you have, it's such a small amount of time. Like, I don't want to say it's like speed dating, but, it, but you know, kind of maybe, it, I don't know. It's a really small amount of time and it's really hard to appreciate that. I, there's a lot of ways in which I've been ranting about technical interviews for a long time. And there are aspects of it that I appreciate a little bit more now, having been on the other side yeah. that I definitely didn't. Yeah. And, and that's not to say there aren't plenty of things to fix. There are, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. but you know, the, you interview a bunch of people. If you make one comment that comes across bad, no one wants to judge you for one comment. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you make one comment that comes across badly in a way that you wouldn't be a great person to work with, or, um, you know, yeah. might not be really interested in the role. And that's one comment when they've met you for two hours, that is yeah. going to have an outsized you know, impact on the situation. And that's not because people are trying to be a jerk. It's because mm -hmm. yeah. you only got to make 10 comments. So one comment becomes a problem. And I don't have a good example of that, right? But like in general, yeah. it's about the dilution of time and the ratio for sure. I do, but I won't call people out on that. <laughs> <laughs> Their name um, is Frank. They live at one, two, three. No, uh. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I have a thing that I have said frequently. Um, it does depend on who you are saying this. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone for whom English is a second language, I do yeah. not have the same uh, critique of this, but yeah. anyone for whom that is not the case, uh, if you are talking about a generic engineering situation and you give the engineer a gender and you make him a he, it's a flag for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a flag. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I've seen situations where people did that. I was not in the interview panel. They joined the company uh, and the flag was there from the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, should I, should I go into my like, here are some of the things that hiring managers shouldn't do that they do do? Spiel. Yeah, you, so I think you, you know you're going to. So go. For I it. am going. To. <laughs> but, uh, hold on. I think. Right I, yeah, I did. I did kind of want to pivot. So I think this is good. I think we should pivot into this side because you all already started to of the interviewer, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, versus the interviewee. Uh, so yeah, I think we should pivot into that. You can go ahead and start with uh, what you want to talk about, and then we'll ask questions from there. So I have two blog posts on this. Um, one of them is senior interviews do not equal three junior interviews in a trench coat, um, which yeah. was the inspiration for the other title. Um, and then, uh, I don't know what the other one's called, but like if you click interviews on my blog as a tag, mm -hmm. you'll find it. Uh, but basically I talk about designing technical interviews. Um, and there's a few things to keep in mind with this. So one is I'm one person, um, I have my own 
biases about people I've worked with who did or didn't interview well. I, I am not the end all be all of decision making on this point. There are plenty of people who would disagree for me for plenty of valid reasons and probably plenty yeah. of invalid reasons too, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to me, one of the biggest things that we don't do well is we don't spend the time up front to decide what we're actually looking for in a role. That's everything from what skill sets this person actually needs to have to what level they need to be and what how you would augment the team. The reason that we fail to do this and the reason, well, we fail to do this because it takes time and it's hard to do and it requires yeah. taking a really like unbiased look at your team. And that's just challenging for a number of reasons. But mm -hmm. the result of that is that the most recent hire ends up needing to have the skills of the current most successful person on the team and the person interviewing them and all of their background because that's the there's this assumption that if you if I want to figure out if you have my current skill set I learned that by knowing this fundamental piece of knowledge so I need to find out if you know this funda fundamental piece of knowledge the problem with that approach is it assumes that everyone learned something at the same time in history so if they don't know this fundamental piece of knowledge so the for example people who came up in a web dev world before react existed mm -hmm. we knew lots of things about you know this and like lots of screwy esoteric javascript syntax stuff that frankly isn't relevant anymore it's historical context yeah. but it's how our brains translate to react yeah. in the modern land because that's how we originally learned there are some people who just go straight to react and have no idea what that historical under the hood context ever was and there are yeah. people who will say well you don't know react if i know this and i'll say no that's nonsense it means they learned react in the last five years and they never needed to go back in history to know why yeah. this other thing was the case right so yeah. don't like project CSS interviews people. yeah don't project oh. on people what knowledge helps them learn the thing you actually need them to know find out the thing yeah. you actually need them to know and ask them about that which goes to the question of like don't expect a specific answer don't spe expect a specific answer yeah the second is if you test drive your interview which you should um on someone on your team who you think should either do really well or really badly like you can test it on someone on your team who shouldn't have this skill set and shouldn't pass and see what happens it's a good signal Expect that it's going to take that person far less time than it's going to take your actual candidate. There are a couple yeah, different yeah. reasons for this. One of them is anxiety. The candidate on your fake candidate on your team isn't really that nervous. They're already on the team. They have nothing to lose or gain. The second is yeah, yeah. they likely probably know a little bit about what's to come. And so they don't have to take the same amount of time to like understand the problem and dive into it. Yeah. Hmm. The third thing is when you list that list of things that a candidate should have skill sets that they should have you know for a fact that it's not just they should know react it's also they're going to be doing uh you know lots of code reviews or they're going to need to be doing some architecture things or they're going to need to be working with clis or blah 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 blah, blah. weight the frequency of those things and those signals at the same level as you weight whether or not they know react because otherwise if you throw someone out of your process because they didn't answer a question well about state in React and you don't yep. expect them to have to deal with state in React, mm -hmm. that's really silly and you just wasted a lot of time. Yeah. Um, all of these are written in, in things I've wrote before, but those are sort of my like default assumptions about designing interviews. Yeah. I'm wondering, or Nick, if you have a question, I see you're about to go. You can go first. Yeah, yeah no, no, I was uh, pretty, uh, <laughs> For, for those who aren't aware, I, I pumped up a, a, a pool outside the house in the heat and I'm still melting. So if I look like I've got butter all over my face, that's why. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, no, you were talking about stuff you need. It, like, it's so, you know, like, what are your thoughts on, you know, because I was actually speaking to an ex-coworker, an old coworker last week on our old Slack and they, they were they were crafting a crafting. I hate saying that name. Sorry. Uh, just writing up a uh, an interview. Uh, sorry, uh, a job. Uh, I can't speak today. A job, job description. And, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my brain still sizzling. So they were writing up a job posting, and I, I suggested changing some wording. But then they were saying like, um, you know, all of these skills are required for this job. And I mentioned to mm. her like it, it was in the context of a web development job. So they were, you know, I think it was uh, a React role. But then it said like 
you must have web gl experience and i and i okay. told her i said like i know literally one person that does web gl and i don't even really know him well but like ken wheeler he's the only person i know that does web gl <laughs> and do yeah so like i said you know like there are i know a, a couple because i'm in like the creative coding community but that's a very specific like very niche niche. Thing. <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I said like you're you are going to be removing so many potentially amazing candidates by saying that you absolutely need this and then mm-hmm. she she switched it to like she, she took my suggestion to say like it's optional and I said because like, they said they had somebody at the company already that knew web jail I said well why not you, you know if they if they don't have that experience you know have that person train the new people if they don't have mm-hmm. that skill so so it's, you know, like sometimes, and, and I got to be honest, even as like a, as, as being further on in my career, I, I've even doubted myself for applying for some jobs because said, you need this, this, this. And I, I remember one job I applied to, it took me like six weeks before I applied because I was like, you know what, YOLO, just do it. And, you know, just because it said you need literally all these things, you know, so it's, mm-hmm. I don't know, the struggle's real. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. I think there's a lot of times where companies... Uh, this will probably get onto a bit of a topic I want to talk about in a little bit, but like there's companies that think they know what they want or they don't know exactly what they want. So they throw in like the whole, you know, everything uh, with it. And then they're like, this is what we need. Instead of thinking yeah. of the skills that are already on their team, who can like help someone else coming in. Like I had this experience where uh, someone needed something very specific, which I could do. It was green sock animations. Uh, And when I came in, they also wanted me to eventually learn some other stuff, but they gave me that time to learn those things. So they could still bring me Mm -hmm. on to do like what they wanted me to do. But then like I had time to learn the other stuff. And I think people forget that like we're learning all the time. Yeah, if we want, if we're interested, just put something like interested in learning WebGL or something like that. And you probably get a lot more candidates versus you have to have web yeah. geo well because it's just like at work like imagine all of a sudden one day uh, at forum they say uh we uh we do need to use web gl we're going web assembly everybody needs to know rust it's not like they're going to say we're letting everybody go because nobody knows rust <laughs> it's going to be like hey we're going to just start learning rust you know like uh, I don't yeah know. i'm learning Everyone linux right now rust. it's really fun <laughs> yeah no i'm learning i'm learning rust i'm, I'm learning in public with rust i'm enjoying it so <laughs> And I think Andrew in the chat was saying he's a fan of Rust too. So, yeah, there we go. Right. Um, kind of yeah. on the same topic, I, and you may not have opinions on this. You may, so if you don't, we can go on to the next thing. But I'm wondering what you think of companies. So we just talked about like there's companies that will like list all this specific stuff. What do you think of companies hiring people who don't really actually necessarily have defined like what they need? They're like putting their feelers out for something they need. They don't. I love form. I've told them this already when I was getting this job. They didn't know what they needed. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an interesting interview but I'm wondering if you have like any opinions on that like when you go to an interview and they're just kind of like almost like you sell me the job yeah 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 so um that's a very nuanced and layered thing um so first mm-hmm. of all there is a type of person who is totally open to that possibility yeah. and opportunity there is a type of person who has no interest in being recruited for a role that doesn't have any definition around it. Yeah. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you are the type of person who's like, uh, uh, no, uh, great. Like I, when I was interviewing during that six month period, someone came to me for a head of DevRel role. Um, Mm -hmm. and they said, you know, we're not really sure what this looks like. And I was like, great. I'm not the person for you. Like I, that's not something (laughs) I'm interested in doing right now. Um, and, and they took it pretty hard, weirdly. Um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, that was not the right, the right fit for me, but there are people yeah. for which it will be the right fit. I don't actually think that matters depending on what stage the company is in and how okay. they plan on treating the person once they're hired, right? Yeah. That's the really key part here. So if you mm-hmm. come and you don't know what you want from a person and you both agree that it's a good idea, they come on board and then you say, oh, this is what we want. And if you don't do this, then you're not in the right place. You're yeah. an asshole, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you are really, um, I would call this a collaborative opportunity. So if you mm-hmm. are hiring um, opportunistically 
for a collaborative situation where you know the person has skill sets that you need and you want them to help craft the role in which they can use those skill sets at your company. Uh, there are people who have been very open about this happening. Like when Sarah Dresner went to Netlify, she talked very openly about the fact that mm -hmm. this was just a conversation and she told them what she was interested in and they were amenable to it. And then she came on board and she got to help craft that image. Um, yeah. That works out really well. If there is someone who you know you want to hire because you want their skill set and then you try and shoehorn them into what the business need at the company is because yeah. you're not open to that and i've seen this happen live and in person um that's a really bad situation and completely unfair to the person that you're hiring so mm -hmm. i'm not against it as long as the company is really willing to follow through with that um yeah. from yeah. from the start yeah, yeah no, i think that's, that's a great point, point. Yeah, from my own experience, uh, for Forum, it's worked out well for me. It's been fine. But there were other people that I was interviewing with at the same time. And because I was interviewing, I was coming in as like a technical person, but I was also interviewing for like community management stuff and, and DevRel and things. There were all, a lot of companies that, especially in community management nowadays, is like a role that like yeah. companies don't exactly know what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, you, even in my time at They don't know how Forum, to do it, which is why they yeah. have to hire someone for it. Exactly. Oh, yeah, Even yeah. in my time at Forum, I've been like, actually, I'm a developer advocate in this role. And so we've switched it. Like, they yeah, might yeah. not know it. Um, but yeah, there have been companies where to me, it was just like this, exactly like you said, I think you're just trying to fit me in somewhere that this may not even go anywhere. And I'm like, you know what you want. And so uh, I, I think that's a great point. Yeah. I think community management, DevRel, Dev Evangelist, whatever you want to put, I mean, the Dev Advocate, there's a bunch of things under that title. I think that's an area mm -hmm. where this happens quite a lot. Um, yeah. And that's because companies are often hiring um, for those roles and they've never had anybody in those roles before. So they themselves yeah. don't know what they're looking for. And two, this is going to get me a lot of flack. Um, a lot of companies are hiring developer, they are hiring for a DevRel role because they want to hire someone with an audience that they can then associate their mm -hmm. company to, yeah. right? So they're looking to just get someone with a name and a following and a public persona and then use them to walk around and be a public representative, not really salesy, but like yeah. network effect influencer for their technology and what they're building. Yeah. Oh, Sierra Ford just made a really great point about this on a on a Twitter spaces that I saw the other day. She was like, well, companies do that. And then they don't realize once you have your platform and if that's what they're hiring you for and you go somewhere else, what happens then? Yep. Yep. All those people no. are going to go somewhere else too. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. it's a real, real thing. And I think it's really, that that's why this happens in sort of the DevRel space a lot because they can't tell you what they want because they don't know what they want beyond the fact that they want someone who's uh, visible to be associated with their brand. And that's a very, very complex thing that I think we're working out as an industry right now. Because what it used to be, DevRel used to be people who weren't necessarily like DevRel specific skills. They were very senior engineers in the company mm -hmm. who eventually transitioned to speaking a lot on stage and being very public. Problem with that yeah. is that you ended up with nothing but white men. Um, yep. So it's it's making some sort of serpentine movements um, about what that's going to look like. And I decided to step away from DevRel as a career. Mm -hmm. I didn't really enjoy it. There's lots of there's lots of DevRel type things that I do as what I call a private citizen. Yep. Um, <laughs> and I do lots of those things, but they're not my job. And to anyone who thinks that I'm a developer relations person because I write blog, blog posts and I make videos and I'm on podcasts and all of those things, that's like the really, really tiny tip of the iceberg of the public things that you can yeah. see a DevRel person do. I don't yeah. have to deal with any of the other nonsense they have to deal with, yeah. like that actually makes their jobs hard. Just saying. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, Sam Julian, I think I'm saying his right, name right. Mm -hmm. uh, getting yeah, started in developer relations. Uh, they, yeah. That's their book and they all also mentioned in that like you a lot of people think they want to be in DevRel they have this side of like uh you know the pastures are greener over there and then they forget like there's also these awesome things already in their job that they have and they can do these other things on the side if they want like you don't have to have the DevRel role like I didn't yep. till just recently but I was doing those things because I liked them I was you know teaching people I was doing courses I was talking whatever because I liked them like you can be an educator without exactly developer relations and it's actually sort of freeing because you don't have to talk about any specific thing like do you think Netflix cares if I talk about Netflix 
In fact, they yeah. probably prefer that I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's really nice. I can talk about whatever I want. I can learn I'll whatever talk about I want. our code. Post whatever I want. It's yeah, great. Yeah. Oh, I thought we were talking about movie reviews for a sec. How many Rotten Tomatoes do you give? Uh... <laughs> I will say uh, uh, the one thing that I can't do now, I mean, I'm sure I could, no one would really care, but I'd feel bad about it, is I feel like I don't tweet um, about what I'm watching unless it's something I'm watching on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And I can't complain about all of the situations I've had in the past few months where all of my TV streaming apps are crashing. None of yeah. them are named Netflix, but I can't talk about it because I look like I'm bashing the competition. But let me tell you <laughs> what is happening. It's become impossible to watch television. Can we talk about Disney Plus? I can because that 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 it's that streaming is the worst one. That's not even the worst one. <laughs> oh, it's all coming out. It's all coming out. <laughs> Good thing this isn't recorded or live. All right. Uh. <laughs> How do I get U.S. Netflix in Canada? You can't. You can't get. You um, can, but you well, can't. CPN, but I, okay, I it, can't be on this podcast if you're going to have that conversation. <laughs> We're cutting that off. We'll talk later, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, abort, abort. <laughs> uh, ne- oh, ne- Netflix will catch your VPN, so good try. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I just said Pause that I care what I say, but come on now. You're making me look bad. The, the, there's too we many do LOLs not condone this. Yeah, yeah, we don't condone <laughs> this. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is not Lori. Listen, this is I went through a long in, time a without the office in, in, when, in Costa Rica. It was really sad. And that's what everyone kept telling me. Get a VPN. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, the U.S. doesn't have an office right now anyway. Yeah, now, but they did for a yeah. long time and I didn't. <laughs> that's all, that's all, okay, all right, all back to tech interviews. <laughs> no more Netflix. You did just take our wonderful manager. Um, <laughs> Netflix did. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Molly is wonderful. We are happy for her that she's at Netflix. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, Netflix is We're very lucky happy to have acquired. I definitely <laughs> didn't know that was happening until it happened. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I talked to Molly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Speaking of which, right. yeah, interviews. Okay, let's go back to interviews. <laughs> uh, all right. So we were talking about the perspective of the interviewer for a while there which we can keep yeah. going on if we want to. Uh, Nick, you sounded like you had a conversation and I cut you off or a uh, topic. So go ahead. Well, no, it's it's kind of going back to the, what we're talking about, like at the beginning when Lori was mentioning, you know, like take home tests and all that. Like mm-hmm. uh, I've, I've done all those kinds of things, even like, you know, I, I do have a lot of privilege. I am a white guy in tech, even though my name's not Chad. Um, <laughs> but like, I've ha- I've always had the privilege to be able to like spend a ton of time on take home tests and stuff. And and honestly, when they say it's like a two hour take home test, I spend the weekend on it. I really have. And it's like some the thing that, about it though is like like the the jobs were interesting, and I was like I felt like I I, I had to do it or I had to. I, go above and beyond to just stand out and I you know like years ago I well I always have conflicted thoughts on like what to tell people because like when I think of it from like a sports contest you know it's like uh you know when you're young on the soccer team everybody gets a medal and everybody gets orange slices at halftime but then when it comes to like you know oh you're 13 now oh yeah Bobby you're not starting you know like and it's kind of, I mean, like, it's like that in the real world, you know, like at the end of the day, they're only hiring one person or, or two people, however many roles are. And so it's like, I'm always conflicted because I know there's privilege in being able to spend time on these things. But I also have the mentality of like, I want the job. So I'm going to, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this test look really good. Like I'm like, they said, do the test. I did tests. I, you know, like one one job I applied for, uh, which I did end up working at, like I had to build a full blown password browser extension or or pretty close. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I pretty much did most of it because like, I was like, I want to work here, you know? And like, I'm not saying this is good. It's just like, I felt this pressure, whether it was myself or just like 
the current state of interviewing at that point. This was like more like 2017, but I don't know. I, I don't know if I really have a point here aside from like, it's just, <laughs> it's just like, even when there's these tests, you know, like I've, I've felt the pressure to just say, I'm going to do them regardless, you know, the interview process is broken, but like, you know, this place ended up being a great place where I worked at, but you know, like, is it good that, you know, I, I did all that? I don't know, you know, and like years ago I would have said yes, but now it's like, I have really conflicting thoughts about it. So <laughs> I'm going to admit to something that I don't think I've ever admitted to before. So my very first job that I ended up taking, I had a couple offers. Um, but my very first like full-time coding job, they sent me literally like a word document with like pseudocode for the, they wanted me to answer with pseudocode for three different mm -hmm. problems. Um, and one of them was some recursion thing that I don't even remember. And I looked it up in my master class notebook, right? Like I okay. had taken mm -hmm. notes on this in class and I looked it up because technically it was my work, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I'm sure that's considered cheating. I'm straight up sure I cheated, right? It was my work, yeah. but it wasn't like live and in person, but they didn't really give any instructions. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, and not yeah. only did I get hired at that job, I did very well at that job and surpassed a lot of the people who had been there longer than me. And then I left. And one of the conversations okay. that I had with my senior engineer when, when I'd been there for about six months and shown that I was doing really good work, they changed the interview process. And I looked at okay. the new interview process and I said, I wouldn't pass this. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. yeah, but you're here. So it doesn't matter. I said, of course uh, it matters because I'm doing yeah, yeah. well here. And if I wouldn't be able to get in the door today and other people who I know you've had to teach the same things again and again and again, and it's just like, they don't have that sense for what like clean code looks like. And they need a lot of mm -hmm. handholding who have been here for multiple years. You're struggling with them. And they would clearly pass that test that mm -hmm. tells me that it's a bad test. And yeah. like, he sort of sat there for a while and he thought about it. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Did they do anything about it? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. I always think that's a really good exercise to do. If, if you can jump through whatever the loopholes are and the hurdles that you have to get to, to get into a, a job, because you're really excited about the job. I'm not going to knock anyone for doing whatever it takes to get the job that they want. I mean, yeah. ethically. Right. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> after I just talked about cheating, right. Um, yeah. No dead, no dead, no dead bodies. No dead right. bodies. But like you do, do what you need to do. Even if, even if you have a moral issue with the interview process, but you've decided that you want to do it anyway, because you want the job in question, which I have certainly done before. Um, yeah. Once you get in the door, it is your job to look mm -hmm. at what makes you successful and be honest with yourself. Are you successful? What are you successful at? What skills are you showing and using that makes you successful? Look at, around at your peers, look around at your managers, look at the skills that are making people successful there. And then the sort of like table stakes skill sets that everybody have that need to exist and use that to take a hard look at what the front door looks like. Because if yeah. people are getting in the front door for skills that they don't end up using and then being successful in spite of the gatekeeping that occurred, you have a lot of improvements you can make. And I think we don't probably do that enough. We have this sort of uh, survivorship bias where we're like, well, we passed it. And so it yeah. wasn't great, but you know, we got in here and we're, we're doing awesome. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, but wouldn't it have been better if you didn't have to? Because think of how many awesome people you could be losing out on. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. I, I agree with that. I, I think like Nick, like you were saying, there's conflicting stuff there. And I think it's hard when, especially when you talk about someone first breaking into tech. And I see this a lot anyways on, on Twitter and other places where people are like, you shouldn't be spending putting and, and you know, that shouldn't be your life. And I think while that is valid, like, <laughs> criticism and I've gotten to that point in my life I also had to do a lot to get to that point in my life at first and yeah. I did have to devote a lot of time to coding and the same thing as like a lot of these uh, interviews that you go into you end up devoting a lot of time whether you want to or not but I think the point there that Lori has is that if we've done that and we went through that we shouldn't have to make everyone else go through that and have to have 
the same thing. Like we should take that in the sense of like, yeah. well, how can we do better now and not have to put all these people through this because it's miserable. <laughs> like, own your hypocrisy, right? Like I, yeah. I'm yeah. a person who sits up here all the time and I talk about burnout and I think that's important. And I, I talk about like, you shouldn't have to be passionate about coding. And then I have like six different free time side hustles that I work on at any given time. Yeah. Like a, a yeah, yeah. damn course book, whatever the heck you want to call it about compilers. Like, is yeah. that a normal yeah, yeah. thing that people do <laughs> on their, you know, pre-work mornings? No. Would yeah, I yeah. recommend anyone else do it? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. uh, not I would recommend sure. you all to do some courses if you want to, though, because sometimes you can make pretty good money with that. And <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Well, or sometimes that... you can put a lot, a lot of work into it and make like a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> yes, that too. I've done that. Uh, you got to be yeah. selective. That can be a whole different um, uh, Twitch stream on uh, being selective and, and, and knowing who to go to for courses. But yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just laughing at uh, with Andrew's kind of trolling you in the <laughs> in the chat a bit. Too. See, it's someone like, saying I was thinking about writing a bombing interview as uh, writing about bombing an interview as well, but wasn't sure if I should put in which company. Can we talk about that? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure. gonna say I don't know. Um, I think I've done <laughs> both. <laughs> I don't know that it's good to put the actual company be if it's somewhere you think that you might want to work in the future. Like if you think you want to work there again, don't put the name, talk about the problems, talk about it. If, if they are following you at all, they might still see it. Like there are a couple of people that I interviewed with. I did write a post, Andrew, making fun of people putting posts in the <laughs> job interview process that I went through. And I did talk about the general stuff there. And some of the people um, knew like that I was talking about mm -hmm. them and they reached out to me and got like my voice, my advice and stuff like that. I didn't have to put their name. <laughs> they knew I was talking yeah, about yeah, them yeah, yeah. because they knew their interview. <laughs> but so, go ahead, Lori. What do you think? <laughs> this is very complicated. So I wrote that really, really long post and I didn't put names mm -hmm. because I wanted it to be about me and not the places. And two, because yeah. I wasn't telling you like what their interview processes were. I was telling you yeah. my critiques of them. So that's yeah. different. If you are saying I bombed an interview and this is why, and this is where it went poorly. If you're not like totally ripping on a company and you're doing it in a way that shows that you put time and effort into their interview process and may want to work there again. By all freaking means, if you're writing about a single company, go ahead and put the name. That being said, there's a very big difference between writing about interviewing at Forum and writing about interviewing at Google. Yeah. Google yeah. is a very, very big house that you can throw a lot of stones at. And even if you're not throwing stones, other people might see it, but like they're not going to care. If you're yeah. writing about a very small company and giving away very specific interview questions That's that true. they may or may not change very often, mm. they might not appreciate that very much. Yeah. Or at all. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, no, that's you're like I have a thought, but I can't. Get yeah, yeah, out. yeah, no, 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 no. It's just I don't know. I'm just thinking of a this interview I had once, and it was just it went so poorly. It was when I was younger, but like I, I don't know if either of you've ever had. Should a... we just talk about bad interviews now? The rest of the time, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, bad sure. interviews. <laughs> it, ahead, it was babe. like it was literally the entire company interviewing me. It was a smaller company, mm -hmm. but it was like nine people at like this huge oval table i sat down and it was literally like rapid fire rapid fire rapid and like it got to the point where like i said i'd probably just google it so many times and like i was just like yeah i'm out like I, at that point i didn't want to work there anyways mm -hmm. but it was just like i don't know it, it was like they were coming at me like from all sides and it was like it was just brutal it was not enjoyable it was stressful and and this is something we can talk about too like i don't know how how both of you feel when you interview but even later on in my career I get nervous for every interview still I like mm -hmm. I you know I mean I know what I'm talking about but it's like I'll like overstudy things and like I don't know it's just I don't know maybe it's maybe it's just me I have this like lack of, even though I'm confident in my skills I still have this like this little guy up there that says hey you lack self-confidence and uh, I don't know what but uh, I get nervous for interviews for jobs that I really want. Yeah. 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 Which is not every interview I do. It yep. probably says something about where I'm putting my time. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, 
I found myself when I was interviewing for some of those, there were a couple of them where I was like, I really don't care. Like it could be a good job, but I'm not super invested in it. And what happens is it's all relative. So when I was Mm -hmm. interviewing, going through a process for three different places at the same time, there was one job that I wanted. There was one job that I really wanted. And there was one job that I wanted more than all of the, all of the others. So all of a sudden, the other two jobs that I wanted weren't that stressful yeah. because they weren't the job that I really, really, really wanted. Um, yeah. And it's a good point. That, that That's both helpful and hurtful in any number of ways because it meant that I like bombed the yeah. job for the one that I really wanted because I didn't put that much time and energy onto it. I was also less nervous for it, but like, yeah. I didn't care. Yeah, yeah. No, but it is a good point. Maybe- Maybe it is, maybe it has been jobs that I really want. I never really thought about it. Uh, mm-hmm. Cause come, come to think of it now, there have been other jobs where like I just met them and it, I felt cute, cool as a cucumber. The other thing mm-hmm. too is, uh, and you mentioned this at the start is, you know, when you're interviewing and you have a job, it's like, whatever, you know, I mean, like you still interviewing and, and like you want, I don't mean whatever, but I mean. Depends on how much like, you want to get out of that job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, but no, no, for sure. But what I mean is like, there's not that added stress of I have to find a job immediately because I don't have money. You know what I mean? Like, I know there's like toxic places. Yes, I get that too. Um, So uh, that's actually interesting. I think it depends on the person and the situation. And I completely understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. right? Like put food on the table, all of that. But there are definitely people I know who have been nearing the end of their savings who are interviewing who are less mm-hmm. stressed than the people who are too risk averse to leave a job and therefore are looking down like the tunnel of yeah. a seemingly never endless, emotionally abusive and battering environment. And that's sometimes worse, right? Like yeah. mm-hmm. I know I need to find a way to pay my rent is mm-hmm. very significant. And I'm not trying to diminish that, but I know I need to find a way to pay my rent um, is a level of like, I have a specific goal and a specific time. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that's helpful in a way that I don't know when I'm going to be able to get out of this. That's like an emotional burden when you're going through an interview process that you can't move away from. So I actually have friends who have quit Mm -hmm. toxic jobs, despite knowing that it would put them in an insecure financial position because- the fear of what they were going through was just like too much. And so they tried to interview and not have to leave. And then they realized that they had to leave because they couldn't get through the interview processes because they were just that happened to me. (laughs) I've been through that. (laughs) And it's person dependent, right? Like it's it's not, it's not a tragedy Olympics here. Like one is not better or worse than the other. They're very, very different circumstances. Yeah. I think we can, we can keep, Go ahead, Nick. No, I was just gonna say you hit a tipping point, whatever that is, and it's like you just got it. Like I, I totally, like, I've been in like kind of one toxic place near the end of when I was working somewhere, but, uh, but I, I can totally understand if you're like psychologically being like, you know, just like on your brain and because it, it affects your body too, like, uh, you know, like, uh, anyways, no, it's it's a really good point, Lori. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I think we can keep talking about uh, probably bad interviews all day, which we can get to in a minute. I do want to mention kind of, because you all were talking about the sense of like some of the interviews you go to that you don't necessarily want, um, you know, uh, you're not as stressed. I, I had this um, for my first interview ever for a tech job. I want to kind mm-hmm. of just bring up the point of like what a good interview can do for you because I we were like at our ropes in like my husband and I, we didn't, we needed money really bad. I went to target and just applied to like work at target. Right. Just to like, just do something. Cause we needed something. He was doing something else part-time. And, um, the interview I had at target, even though it was just for like, a, a you know, I think it was stocking stuff. It was such a good interview. Like the person made me feel great. We had like, we talked and, and it was good. And the next day I happened to have the interview for the tech job that I didn't think I was okay. going to get. It was the first one I was, you know, ever interviewing at, but I was so put at ease with like that 
interview and like how well it went that that interview that I had for that tech job, my first one ever went so good that I got the job. Like they called me that day that I got it. And so Mm -hmm. I think there's also the sense of like, maybe even if, and Target's different than like having a tech job go interview, go well, even if you don't get the job, but I had, I've had that too, where I've had like tech interviews where I didn't get the offer, but the interviews were so good. And they left me like feeling good that even if I didn't get the offer, like they helped me later on with like my other interviews. And I don't know if you all have had any of those kinds of experiences. I've had interviews where the questions asked were eerily similar and Mm -hmm. therefore it Mm -hmm. made it easier to answer them. Um, I had that both with sort of like the personal problem solving questions yeah. and I've I've straight up had tech rounds that are mm-hmm. like almost the same and I was like oh I literally saw that last week yeah um yeah that's super helpful yeah uh, <laughs> I I hate the I have nice. this in one of my posts but I I hate the advice people give of like always be interviewing because I think mm-hmm. interviewing in this industry is super uh harmful and somewhat emotionally abusive and taxing and therefore yep. why would you always put yourself <laughs> through that um at the same time if you are actually going to try and get a job, if you can get yourself an interview before the interview you really care about, do it. Mm-hmm. Just get the cobwebs out because it's a different skill than doing the job. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. That that was going to be my question. So, see, you got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, and that's that brings up the other thing, like you said, like interviewing is a, a skill or t- its own job, you know? Like it's, you know, like, you could be an amazing person. You could be a great developer, but like you could be bombing interviews because because you have to get in that interview kind of mode, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, like I don't know. I remember, like for this is more related to code examples and stuff. But like you know, when you do these code challenges, there's a lot of sites where you just it's it's the specific way these problems work. So you just start going through them and stuff and. And also, just like you said, like the, you know, like, oh, you know, like, like a stereotypical question, what's your, what's your weakness or what's your strengths, you know, and then you bomb that maybe on a first interview, but then the next one, like you said, (laughs) nailed it, you know, so it's like, I I can see the benefit of interviewing, but I've also never like interviewed a ton, a ton, like it's like, I usually... I usually just kind of like, there's a few jobs I know I want to do. And then like, I, I, I don't do all these extra interviews just to get practice at least that's what's happened to me but yeah I think it's also very different to be having the conversation amongst people who are some ways into their career versus being early on in your career I mean Mm -hmm. I think there's an expectation that unfortunately the market is very oversaturated with um new career developers and we're not creating the space for them like they have in the past Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. be a whole other you know multiple hour long conversation um (laughs) but in those cases i think those people do find themselves doing a lot of interviews because they also don't get great feedback um they get a lot of ticky tack feedback and they get a lot of ticky tack feedback because the answer is they could do the job and they interviewed just fine and so did six other people and therefore they're going with one of the other ones because you know yeah picking him out of the hat you all have the same skill sets um Mm -hmm which is not to say that everyone is replaceable. That's not what I mean. It's just, it's a very tricky market right now to be earlier in your career in a certain number of technologies. Like, I don't think that's the case in security. I don't think that's Mm -hmm. the case in cloud and SRE land. I do think that's the case in specifically React development. I think Um, there is this huge, huge number of people who are self-taught, who are coming out of boot camps, even people who are, you know, finishing CS degrees and they all have very similar portfolios and they were told to make portfolios and make a website and have a presence on Twitter. And it's very hard to distinguish yourself in that pool of people right now, at least from what I'm hearing. Um, I, I have not hired um, a ton of uh, more junior people. I, I, I think, forget who said it, but like somebody said, like, it's almost like y- you're, you have a marketing job as well, you know, because you're, mm-hmm. you know oh, yeah. what I mean? Like, like when I started off, I mean, well, one Twitter didn't exist, but like, uh, you know, it's not like I have to be, it was, you know, nowadays, cause everybody's doing it. You know, just like, 
you have to be you know you know uh, there's good things i like this like building in public public and all that stuff you know tweeting you know like 100 days of code there's like goes on and on and on you know and like and it's like you kind of have to get on that train because like that's what like you said all a lot of these earlier developers that like that's kind of what they're doing you know like everybody's mm -hmm. I, I see tons of people doing the 100 days of code uh stuff like that it's uh it's like a whirlwind to to, to get, we get into 100 now. days of cloud they're in here in our oh, chat yeah, yeah. um oh, oh. <laughs> yeah the cloud space <laughs> i also think and Lori, you mentioned this at the really beginning and someone else um was in the chat mentioning this uh, as just kind of it was glad to hear this from you but i think everyone thinks there's this sense of it. it's really really hard to to break in when you're a beginner which it is and we all know that just like we're talking about here but also what i found and i know other people in similar situations is like when you're in tech for a little bit and you say you're looking for a job, people are like, oh, you're going to get it like right away. Like, no, no worries. Yeah. You're going to get a job super fast. And so then even when, so when you're going through those interviews, that like breaks you down even more. You're like, no, I'm not. Look, it's yeah. taking a lot of time for me to, you get, just like you said, Laura, you get through, like when I was interviewing again, before I got this job, like I didn't have the, have to go through a recruiter almost every like place I sent a resume into I got a job and I talked to like the hiring manager and stuff not a job I got not an interview really. and I talked to the hiring manager and stuff uh, and you know I went through those processes but that's just like you said almost even more draining mm -hmm. because you go through like what six interviews seven interviews for yeah. all these companies I mean <laughs> I do want to be clear about something like if I needed a job it would yeah. have been infinitely easier for me to get hired as who I was in mm -hmm. you know, 2020 or maybe even 2021, whatever it was, April, I guess, mm -hmm. it would have been infinitely easier for me to do that than it was when I was first starting yeah. out or than yeah. anyone who's first starting out in 2021, like comparing yeah. it to 2010, that's not really a fair comparison. Anyway, infinitely easier. I could have gotten a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My standards for what that job is have also gone up with my experience. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, caring about the place that I work, caring about the salary I'm making, obviously everyone cares about that, but like the the baseline I was starting with was different. Um, the technologies that I had interest in working with were different. The ability to do all the things I do on the side and still have my main day job were different, right? Like the criteria I had were a lot more picky. Um, mm -hmm. And I was going from a decently well-known startup at the time and I didn't, and I had worked for, prior to that to, you know, at companies no one's ever heard of in my mm -hmm. sort of geographic area. And I had decided I wanted to stay in that sort of known space because I enjoyed it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so again, I was hiring, I was interviewing and looking at roles and companies that were infinitely harder. Like I had, mm -hmm. I had moved the hurdle or, you know, what is it? Pole vaulting. I had moved yeah, that yeah, like yeah. way, way, way <laughs> up commensurate with. So like the challenge was probably similar, though still easier than when I was yeah. first breaking in or when someone yeah. was first breaking in now. But I sort of like did that to myself and I could have undone that at any opportunity, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I found it infinitely easier for me to... Um, not get necessarily a full-time role, but to then just work with multiple companies just doing like contract stuff. So okay. uh, while I was interviewing, it while me. I was interviewing, I didn't have a job because I left the company that I was at, but I did have a job because I, and that gave me more of a sense of like, just like you said, I got to be a little bit pickier when I was interviewing at other places because I had something. <laughs> Andrew's in here. Andrew, mm -hmm. let me work with him. Uh, I worked <laughs> with Andrew. I worked with Digital Ocean and a couple other places. Um, but yeah, that was something that I did find easier. And something I've mentioned, like, <laughs> that drives me kind of bananas is that, like, uh, as you start to build up a body of work, and I think this has different, this has different sides to it. Not everyone can, like, spend a lot of time and do blog posts and, and do courses and show their work and stuff. But when you do yeah. have that, um, it's frustrating for me, like interviewing at places and them asking me to do like some project that's almost exactly like a project I've done. Like, I'm like, can we just talk about this project? You see, I've done this. Like, yeah. <laughs> whereas when I was doing the contracts, 
companies always came to me and were like, hey, do you want to do this? And I'm like, okay, do you want to interview? They're like, no, we're giving you this. Do you want to do this? <laughs> like, you know, it was so different than the world yeah, of yeah. having to interview at tech companies. You just, they like, were like, hey, we need this thing. You can do this thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Work with us. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but that also comes with experience uh, because you, oh. like, like, I mean, you've done a LinkedIn course on CSS animations. Like you're, you're, you're pretty, uh, well, I don't know how well known you are, Christina, but like, like basically you have street, you have street cred, you know what I mean? So it's like for them to ask you to start, you know, do some, you know, code coding tests to say, like, just make this thing spin would be kind of almost insulting, you know, like, and you can, you have stuff to refer to as well, you know, like you said, yeah. and, and that, I think that's one thing that's actually helpful. Like, I know you blog a lot, Laura, you do other stuff too, but like just having all that body of work, like over time it compounds and it's just stuff you can reference to people or when they're looking you up, they can, you know, like as a potential candidate somewhere, like they can say, oh, well, she wrote about that. Oh, you know, like I, I know not everybody does this and I know not everybody can maybe for whatever reasons, but it's definitely been helpful. And like, uh, even like we work in open source. So like, Oh, yeah. we kind of have it you know i know people do contribute to open source as well obviously outside of work but like just being able to have our work like out in the open it's like you know if ever somebody wanted to see what i <laughs> i do well it's like well literally just you know go look at my pull request on github you know i know you can't do that with closed source but it's just like yeah. you, you have all these things out and it just compounds over time you know and it also helps build a hopefully positive reputation about you as well you know it doesn't mean you have to be like you know the hundred thousand followers on you know twitter or something but like it, it's 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 legitimate stuff that folks can read or see about you and they're like oh yeah okay yeah you know like and hopefully that changes the tone of an interview i don't it probably doesn't always but <laughs> that's what i'm saying exactly. it doesn't that's, yeah I, no i know i know i know <laughs> I had to say Um, it. I had to say it so you would say that. (laughs) There's a couple, there's sort of one main double edged sword that I think I'm seeing a lot. Um, Two, really. So, one is there's always been an industry around like passing coding interviews. There's now um, a like social media persona that is Mm -hmm. someone who's all about like helping newbies. And I think that's great. Don't get me wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times that advice ends up not being that helpful because it's the same advice being given to everyone. And if everybody has the same advice, then how does that change the the game for any individual? Um, The second thing is a lot of that advice is have a public persona, um, you know, make content, do all of these things. I think two things go wrong with that. One is as soon as people start doing that, there is a class of people who decide that that's what they want their jobs to be. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's great, but that's a different type of job. And that's an even smaller pool of potential jobs. Yeah. The second is if you are a person who exists on Twitter, for example, tech Twitter, you will very, very, very quickly become convinced that there are about 90 tech companies in the entire world yeah (laughs) and you will see a job posting for your favorite one of those and you will apply to it like the four thousand other people with your resume are also doing and so i actually think one of the best pieces of advice is to get out like network with people don't get me wrong but try and network into lesser known places Mm -hmm. often places that aren't being tweeted about and don't have someone representing them but someone that you know knows like you know what i mean yeah um, yeah, yeah. and that's not an easy thing to do, but that also means that a lot of those places don't think to look for all of your public stuff because they don't have anyone who works for them that codes in public. Like that's yeah. not a yeah. thing. They're not an open source company. They're not a Silicon Valley company. They're a local company that's dealing with like energy regulation in your town. Mm-hmm. And those are the places you're more likely to get an opportunity than being one of 6,000 people who applied to the brand new junior job that code pen just posted right and i think that's what people don't realize well, that's it, the job i got and it was because oh, it was a small oh. company it was a small it's company fine. i applied to it because it was a, no 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 not code pen the company that 
decided to oh, advertise yeah, yeah. on there was a small company. This is something I told uh, okay. some fellows I was working with the other day is that like people see something online and they think everyone's going to apply to that. I'm not going to apply to it. They got hundred. They did not get hundreds of resumes. <laughs> like they just got a few. And I knew like they were very small, uh, you know, a bunch of people probably were not going to be applying to this. And that's what I applied to. But yeah, I, I think there's two sides to that. Yeah, I was I was going to say you got hired by the fictional energy company. That's amazing. Um, but, no, an agency. But, yeah, uh, but I wanted to touch on one thing you did mention, Lori, because networking one I, that that term always bothers me, but it's it's just meeting yeah. people. But like uh, you're totally right about like don't go in the same spaces. But the thing I tell folks, too, is because a lot of jobs I've gotten throughout my career have been through people I know. And it's like not in like it's not from like a JavaScript meetup. It's not, you know, like it's literally like I'm out with friends or like I played rugby for years and like there's like hundreds of people. It's like a huge network of people and just chatting. And then like somebody's like, oh, I know so and so talk to them. You know, like it doesn't even have to be in the context of the tech realm in terms of like if you're ever looking for something you know like you could just happen to be talking to somebody and like oh yeah you know just finish my boot camp or like yeah i'm i'm looking for my next job oh you do you do websites that's what i always got but uh but like you know y y you never know where where these jobs could potentially come from and like i don't mean like to, like literally go out of your way and just tell everybody that you know outside of tech space to you know i i'm looking for work i'm looking for work but it's just like you'd be surprised where where opportunities could uh, occur basically is what i'm getting at yeah people are important <laughs> um we're starting to hit time so we're going to be respectful of Lori's time here um as well because we've done like an hour and a half and i'm sure we could talk about tech interviews yeah i feel like very, we could talk very, for until like very a long time <laughs> Day job, folks. Day job. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering, do you have anything you want to end on or, or say here uh, that you haven't said it yet? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I can plug things. Is that weird? No, you should. No, plug no, no. Things. Okay. Uh, but, um, but you have to shamelessly <laughs> plug. Shamelessly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I exist on Twitter at Lori on Tech, um, but yep. I'm actually working on and should be releasing soon. Um, the start of the Compilers for Humans project with my good friend, John O'Tander, um, okay. which is at compilersforhumans.com. Um, and you can sign up. It's, uh, there's, we're starting with a free email course. So it's literally a, mm -hmm. entirely free. You're, you'll get a bunch of emails that will slowly teach you about compilers, which are a very helpful and useful thing to understand uh, whether you directly hook into them or not. It's a great way to sort of level up your development skills. So love for everyone to check that out, mostly because we're using the free email course as an opportunity to get feedback on what things, what topics are challenging for people or where they might want more clarity as we work on a uh, much larger offering. So yeah, come yeah. check it out. I, I definitely subscribed to the the compilers one already. Uh, I think okay. last week. When did you drop it? Like a couple weeks ago or a week and a half? I ago? didn't drop it. Joel, this oh, is yeah, Joel hooks got it. Yeah, yeah. Joel just like casually tweeted on the weekend, look at the pretty site. And I was like, Joel. <laughs> he was like, I wasn't, I didn't expect anyone to see it. Like 500 likes later. Yep. I'm like, yep. damn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so no, now it's, it's, it's known that it's coming. I'll do another big tweet about it when it's actually ready to go live. But we're finishing up the draft now. So, yeah. Well, cool. the no, like, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The sixth draft. Uh, so almost the final one. <laughs> Cool, cool. All right. Well, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so we're at time pretty much. I just wanted to say thanks so much for coming on, Lori. This was, I had a great time. And like Christina said, I feel like we could talk about this forever, but maybe we could uh, have you on at another time. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll leave a little cliffhanger for folks there. There we go. Um, thanks so much so, for having me and everyone for uh, hanging out. Yeah. Cool, great cool. chat, y'all. All right, folks. Uh, we will see you next week then. Take care. Bye. <laughs>